All right, so we're going to be talking about chemical shorthand, which basically just means reading and writing chemical formulas. Uh, so to start with, though, we're going to start talking about these right here. These are called the diatomic elements. And these elements just never appear alone in nature. You need to be able to recognize these and know them uh, off the bat, so you need to memorize these. They're pretty easy, though. You'll notice that there are seven of them, and they create a seven in the top corner of the periodic table, and then you have to add hydrogen as well. These always appear bonded to something in nature. They're so electronegative that they just won't last on their own. They need to bond immediately to something else, and often they will bond to themselves. So if I ever say something like, this reacts with oxygen, I don't mean oxygen by itself. I mean O2 every single time. They don't appear alone. So those are something that you need to memorize. But moving on, let's talk about chemical symbols and formulas. So symbols, these are what you're familiar with already. They're on the periodic table over here. It's important that you guys realize that they are one capital, one lowercase, okay? So this is really hard for some students, especially if you've got handwriting where it's hard to tell capitals and lowercases apart. Be very careful with this. So for example here, PU with a lowercase u, that's plutonium, but PU with a capital U is phosphorus and uranium. So you need to make sure that you're paying attention. Is that an L or an I? If you're ever having a hard time with this, please just ask me during class. Uh, but a chemical formula represents a compound, something that's bonded together, stuff that is uh, stuck together in a chemical way. And it's going to tell you the different elements that are present and the number of each of those atoms that are present. So in this formula down here, we have Fe2O3. We have two iron atoms and three oxygens. For some reason, a lot of students think that the little subscript numbers here, which are these tiny guys right there, they think that those apply to the number that they're in front of when it's actually the number that they're behind of. So in H2O, we have two hydrogens and just one oxygen. All right, here's some practice for you if you need a, if you need some help reading some of these. Really briefly, in this one right here, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we have one carbon and four hydrogens. But then we get to these ones down here. These, these three up here are typically pretty easy, but when we get to these, it gets a little bit different because we have these big numbers in the front. These big numbers are called coefficients, and the coefficients apply to every single thing that they're in front of. So instead of having two nitrogens and five oxygens, you now actually have four nitrogens and 10 oxygens. Uh, same thing down here, you'd have six hydrogens and three oxygens. Down here, you would have 17 carbons and 34 oxygens. So these numbers in the front, they apply to every single thing, kind of like the distributive property within algebra. Then we get over here with these ones that are weird with the parentheses, and we'll talk about these in just a second. But before we do, let's get some vocabulary down. Um, now, first, the reason we do formulas, instead of just saying water, why do we have to say H2O? Well, when we get into giant compounds like this one, uh, we really don't want to have to say the full name. This is the entire name of that compound right there, and that's a nightmare. So we instead just use chemical formulas. Now, other vocabulary you need to know include monatomic ion, which we've already worked with. These are atoms that have a charge. So this right here is a monatomic ion of oxygen. This one's a monatomic ion of hydrogen. The way to remember this is mono means one, so like monotheistic, monopoly, that kind of thing. Atomic means atom, and ion means charge. But then we have polyatomic ions, and these are little clumps of atoms. So you might have something like NO3 right here. This is an entire clump of atoms that stay together during a chemical reaction. It stays with its group. And this is going to have a charge on it as well. And so some common ones that you need to at least be familiar with are these right here. And some of these you might have heard of before. You've got ammonium, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, hydroxide, peroxide, and carbonate. These guys just stay together during their reactions. They always act as one giant clump. Um, you don't need to memorize these. I do have these provided on your pink sheets for your tests, but they are useful to be familiar with. You might want to have a copy of these during classwork and homework time. Uh, it's just going to be helpful for you to be a little bit familiar with them. Formulas that have polyatomic ions in them, like this right here is ammonium carbonate. You're going to have parentheses going on with more than one. So we have our carbonate group and we have our ammonium group, but there's two of them. And because there's two of them, we include parentheses. Now, some of you are looking at this and going, that's stupid. Why don't I just take this little two and distribute it? 
you're, you're thinking that you might wanna have this formula instead, right? The reason we do not write them this way is because we're trying to communicate to other scientists that they are two separate groups. They're in two separate places. So you can see here, here's one ammonium and here's the other. They're not bonded together. They're bonded to different parts of this car uh, carbon right here. And so that's why we include the parentheses. Again, with the parentheses here, so we've got our NH42. This too applies to every single thing inside those parentheses but not to the carbonate over here. The carbonate is staying by itself. And we'll practice with this as we go. You'll get used to it and you will be able to do this pretty easily after a while. Right. So now that we've learned how to read these formulas, I'm also gonna teach you how to write these formulas. And these are pr actually very easy. You guys will be surprised at how easy they are. The way that I teach this is we swap and reduce, okay? So what you're gonna do, you're gonna write your cation first, and remember that the cation is positive. So if we're gonna write the chemical formula of sodium and chlorine, the cation goes first. Okay, so we write Na. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at each of the charges, and we're gonna swap the numbers only, not the positive and negative, just the numbers. Now you'll say, okay, there's no numbers here, Ms. Mosqueda. Well, there are, they're implied. We have a one implied with each of those. So when we only have one thing that we're gonna write, we, you don't really put a one right there, you just leave it blank. It's kind of like with variables in algebra. So we know that we need one sodium because there's a one over here, we would put it down here, and one chlorine as well. So our formula becomes NaCl. Now if you're going, wait, what just happened? Bear with me, we're gonna get there. Let's go ahead and skip down here to this one right here. We have aluminum three plus and iodine minus. So we're gonna write the cation first which is aluminum, A-L, easy enough. And then we're gonna go ahead and write I. And let's go ahead and see how many we need of each. So we've got a three over here that's gonna come down to the I and a one over here that's gonna come down to the aluminum. We don't need to write ones, so this becomes A-L-I-3. On this one, really quick, the potassium is the cation, it goes first, chlorine goes next. Both of them have a one charge and so we don't need to do anything there either. So we do these, actually, I'm gonna do some different ones on this side of the board over here. So let's say that we had something like oxygen and magnesium right here. So we've got a two minus and a two plus. Well, we're gonna swap and we're gonna write our cation first, which is magnesium, Mg2O2. Then here's where it comes in to reduce. Each of these numbers is divisible by two. And so we're gonna treat it like it's a fraction, right? You're reducing a fraction. Pretend that these two numbers are in a fraction. And we would get MgO instead. That's what I mean by reduce. Now over here with these ones, uh, your polyatomic ions, remember that if you have more than one polyatomic ion, you need parentheses. So let's do this one first. We can see that there is just a one with each of those, so we don't need to worry about any kind of fancy numbers with the polyatomic ion. So our formula is KNO3. Down here on this one, we do have a number that should have a plus right there. We do have a number that's going to go with the OH, so our formula becomes CA parentheses OH2. Down here, we've got 3 and 1. This is going to become CRNO33. Now, it's pretty easy to write these when I give you the numbers and it's gonna be something that you practice quite a bit in class. But what happens if I give you the elements without giving you any type of charge? Well, what you're gonna do in that case is you're just gonna use your oxidation numbers. This is why we memorize the oxidation numbers in unit four. So if I look on my periodic table and if you need to pull that out, pull it out, I'm gonna see that magnesium has a two plus charge and fluorine has a minus one. And so when we write that, we're gonna get Mg F2. Down here with this one, we have cesium, which is a plus one, and carbon, which is a plus or minus four. Now, which one are you going to end up using? Well, we know that two positives can't bond together, so carbon or carbon's going to have to take the negative here, which will give us Cs4C. Down here, we've got nitrogen and barium. Barium has a two plus and nitrogen has a three minus. We're going to get Ba3N2. 
And that's how you write those with oxidation numbers.